I'm Wally Shira. I had a little time before these fellows in space with Mercury, Gemini, and Apollo, but I guess my flight that would introduce me to Apollo 9 would be Apollo 7. I flew with uh, Walt Cunningham and Don Isley, and we orbited for about almost 11 days, and we thought that was the end of our capability of going to the moon and back. And then Apollo 8 went on to the moon, and then Apollo 9 came along rehearsing for a lunar mission. And Jim McDivitt, Dave Scott, and Rusty Schweikert were the ones who flew Apollo 9. In a way, it's a frustrating mission for them because they have everything required to go to the moon and back. And we always say moon and back is one word. But they went in Earth orbit and practiced with the lunar module in Earth orbit, separated from the command module, and then rejoined again. And of course, then re entered into Earth. And well, they were up there for almost 11 days as well. Their uh, mission went so well that Apollo 10, the next mission, went to the moon and back. And even then, Tom Stafford, who was commander of that mission, was not permitted to land on the moon because they were too heavy to get off the moon again. So Apollo 10 was another rehearsal to go to the moon. This was probably the most important rehearsal as far as a lunar mission went. Uh, Jim McDivitt and I uh, worked with in survival training in Panama and ended up calling him Uncle Milty. And there aren't many people that call him Uncle Milty. Let me stop you. I'm getting some radio interference on the microphone. Okay. Yeah, I'm set. Already? Yes. Well, Jim McDivitt and I had a lot of fun together. I call him Uncle Milty. Not many people call him Uncle Milty. But it turned out that he and I were on a survival training trip in Panama and shared the same camp, the two of us. And we had cot kind of thing you'd hang between trees to sleep in. And we took three trees and used one useful tree. He got his tied up. It was very muddy got in his cot, I got mine tied up, got in my cot, and that third tree tumbled over, so Uncle Milty was in the mud. Uh, that was the beginning of it, but the result of it was we had a lot of fun together. We did some fishing out of a life raft, and I used his life raft. So he began to think, maybe I'm in trouble. <laughs> so from then I called him Uncle Milty. But he and I became very close friends. He uh, was uh, very active with North American after the space program. And one of the directors said, uh, do you know this fellow, uh, McDivitt, oh, you mean Uncle Milty? <laughs> Jim McDivitt called me the next day and said, one of the directors knows you, apparently. <laughs> but that's the way the world goes. Dave Scott. Okay, hang on, let me stop you again. I'm still having problems with the radio interference on the microphone. Oh. I'm going to try tra changing out your battery now. You know, you can start from, uh, from Dave Scott. You get, you get oh, okay, you got the other, all right. Yeah. <coughs> Uh, Dave Scott, the, uh, on this mission, the, the so-called command module pilot, we call McDivitt the commander, Dave Scott the command module pilot, and then Rusty Schwackert was the lunar module pilot. Uh, Dave Scott was one who went on and got another mission. He had Apollo 15 that went to the moon and back and had the great privilege of having the lunar rover, so he had his own little sports car on the moon where Shepard had a mulligan on the moon with his golf club Dave Scott on Apollo 15 had the fun of driving around in the lunar rover. Rusty uh, had that one mission, and we had a lot of fun with him. I just saw Rusty recently. His hair is no longer rusty. It's very white. But <laughs> time has marched on, apparently. Uh, all three have been a lot of fun together. Rusty is very active today with a program about near-Earth orbit, meaning satellites or really asteroids that might possibly impact Earth are a problem. And he's been working on that as a project ever since he left the space program. Very well spoken and done a very good job with it. Well, the crew made the Apollo 9 mission work very well. Uh, they were a little less time than I had on my flight. We had 10.8 days, they had about 10.1 days. So we always rubbed it in a little bit. We had a little more experience than they. But when you think of what they did with that lunar module, separating it in Earth orbit, and they could not re-enter if they lost the opportunity to rendezvous with the command module. So the lunar module was destiny for a total failure if they didn't rendezvous and dock again, which they did, of course, and then re-entered with the command module. The lunar module, of course, was forced into re-entry and went into the Pacific Ocean. The mission was one of those successful ones, which then added up the whole sequence of the Apollo flights to went around, tick, 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 all the way up through Apollo 11. It was rather exciting to see all of these missions come together and done so well. And of course, these three are still good friends. Okay, let's
take a walk this way and you can tell me about hmm. this guy. Well, that display, of course, tells you a great story, but the best story that can ever be told is this very vehicle here, Apollo 9. I can't believe the name they picked for it, Gumdrop. I wanted to name my Apollo flight Phoenix after the terrible loss of Apollo 1. And NASA said, you can't call it anything, so we ended up calling it a very catchy name, Apollo 7. And ever since that time, they had names for this. They called their lunar module Spider, and this, of course, was Gumdrop, which is kind of hard to understand, but that was the fun of it. Well, as you get into this hatch, the command pilot sits on the left side, the, the command module pilot in the middle, and the lunar module pilot on the right side. And you can see there are so many switches in there, it's almost unbelievable, but after spending years training and preparing and hundreds of hours in simulation, you begin to know every switch as if it's part of your wrist almost. You just touch it and you know where it's going. The holes you see around the outside are, are thrusters to make this vehicle maneuver independently of the service module. And these are rotated by function of the crew using a hand controller using a pitch motion, a yaw motion, a roll motion to maneuver this. Now, when it's connected to the service module, the whole big system back of you does all that work, and the smaller thrusters here are saved for re-entry only. The, the vehicle has so well designed that we had made no changes in it since Apollo 7 that would affect the future missions. And the result of that is we had a, a very successful Apollo program. It's interesting to think of how after these years of shuttle flights, over 100 now, we've really not proven a darn thing with shuttle other than the fact that we made a mistake. We're going back to what we call Apollo on steroids, to go back to the moon possibly, and hopefully, but I'm not sure it inevitably, but possibly on the Mars and back. There should be a Mars and back too, not a, just a trip to Mars. We like to confirm those round trips. The uh, this one hatch, we made a major change since Apollo 1. The hatch was essentially bolted on in Apollo 1 and that Gus Grissom was worried about the hatch coming off as it did in his Mercury flight. Uh, that caused their death, of course, because they couldn't get the hatch open when the fire started. And that's a sad story about some of the changes we made in the spacecraft. We made a lot of changes inside after Apollo 1 uh, to prevent fire, uh, prevent systems inside from catching fire. They had a lot of Velcro and little panels covered with Velcro, which were very contamin contaminated, contaminated and as well would burn rather rapidly. We got back to using a little Velcro later in the flights and it worked out quite well. I think the command module is probably best explained by just looking at it and as it says, the sciences do not touch. And I'm it resisting myself to go over there and start touching it. It's interesting how we try to preserve something as beautiful and as magnificent as these vehicles are. Um, go ahead and step up on the step and talk mm. about the, what it's like to live in there. Mm. <coughs> I think the fun of looking at this restored Apollo 9 has been worked over quite thoroughly to make it look better than it really did when it came home, is to realize that was a, my home for almost 11 days in space. Now, it was my home for many, many years before getting into space. You can see the confined area. Oddly enough, there are three places you can be. If you fold up the leg rest, you can have three different people standing in front of that couch. And if you have the couch cleared underneath, you can actually have three people underneath. So there are nine places right there. You could have nine different astronauts and one up in the tunnel to the lunar module. That would not be the way to do it, but that means that of the three people in there, they could go into really nine different places. And that turns out quite well. And as a result, you can stretch and relax. You can work with an exercise device. We screamed for exercise. It was something that the body was really nervous about, that it was being in the weightless environment for a protected, protected period. And your muscles tend to atrophy. And that was something that wasn't briefing that would remind us of it. it was just the fact that you were aware of it, physically aware of it. The, uh, Let me have you turn around and, and face the camera. Hmm. There you go. The, the, the confined volume, of course, affects you very much when you're here on Earth when you weigh a lot, but up there when you weigh nothing, you can move around and feel very comfortable. And as a result of that, uh, 
when people go to sleep at night, they, they try to get their body pitch, pitched in the right position, their, the mattress is the right density if they have an adjustable mattress, and they try to adjust their bodies to sleep. In weightlessness, you weigh nothing, you just float. As a result of that, uh, sleeping is a very easy task. It's so easy that, in fact, you don't really quite crave sleep. You uh, just know that you require it. Take a cut on that one. Who's that strange guy over there? <laughs> Hi, Francis. Good to see you. I would say hello. I couldn't miss the Wally show this morning. I'm here, to, I'm here to remind you what happened if you forget anything. <laughs> yeah, he <you> will. Someone <laughs> keep the story straight. Yeah. Um, when you, I've heard stories about how you get taller when you're in space. When you come back down, you're taller than you were when you. Mm -hmm. Did you experience that? Oh, it, well, you, you know, it, by measurement later. Good morning. Um, do you feel any different coming down because of the weightlessness? The, uh, the experience of being weightless, of course, I had the three different occasions, but the Apollo one made the dramatic changes. Your body does tend to lengthen because the, the, the skeleton is not compressed by the, the weight of your upper torso on your, on your spine. So your vertebrae start separating a little bit, and I think I was about an inch and a half taller after I came back, which went away rather rapidly. The uh, amount of fluid in your system, you rejected about almost two pounds of water, so you, you decreased the amount of fluid in your body, and your muscle tone went down tremendously. The other interesting part was, though, that your, your whole physiological structure was adapting to zero G, which we didn't know we could do. And as a result of that, you, uh, you have a funny sense of feeling that you just stand up and start floating, and you can't do that. This is only after the first few hours. The, uh, the scary part is you lose that muscular tone I was talking about with an exercise device. Uh, we knew that intuitively, not by someone telling us. The other part is that you lost, oh, I'd say in about a month, they would say you lose about 1% to 2% of your calcium structure, so your skeletal structure was at high risk. And this may be one of the other constraints for a long-term mission, such as going to Mars and back. Now, people forget about the fact that we drank water, and we, of course we passed water, we vented the used water overboard, and had water particles floating around the spacecraft, almost molecular in size, which John Glenn called fireflies. We obviously found out what they were. They were really ice crystals, molecular ice crystals. But the water that a human needs in space or in, on Earth, it's about eight pounds of water a day, maybe a little less. That's a ton of water a year. Now, you, where are you going to get all that water when you're up in space? So you have to carry all these things with you, the air you breathe. So it's not something that you can just go into space and say, I'll, I'll, I'll farm this stuff and get it. It's a, an idea that people are talking about. But having been in the environmental business, I know now that only 1% of the Earth's surface is fresh water that you can drink, 1%. That's a pretty small number. Now, 70% of the Earth's surface is covered by water. When they talk about going to Mars and finding water, you can't even see any yet. <laughs> what kind of water are you going to get when you find some on Mars? This is the kind of story we have to worry about. So it has to be purified. It's not just a case of going to Mars and mining water or going to the, one of the lunar poles and getting water out of a so-called ice crystal. This is a, all wishful thinking. We cannot explore space with wishful thinking. We have to know what we're doing before we start. That'll help. Yeah, that's great. <clears throat> um, I think we're good over here. That was a quiet airplane. It was a quiet airplane. Thank mm. heavens. Yeah. Well, welcome to the place we all call... I'm getting radio interference. Oh, my. Let me have you take a half step back. Nine, eight, seven. Nine, eight, seven. Whenever you're ready. <laughs> Go ahead. Welcome to the area I call Wally World. And my astronaut friends don't like that very much at all, but apparently the museum is going to reconcile that and 
eventually call it the Walter M. Shira Wally Shira Space Gallery. And that will be sometime in the future, I hope. It'll be done, and I look forward to see, seeing the results of it, because right now it's mixed up with aircraft, spacecraft, and, and Wally Shira at this time. Probably the one thing I'd like to point out to you, though, is many people don't even notice it when they come in here, is the, the monkey spacecraft. I'm going to point over to this in a moment, yeah. Okay, whenever you're ready. Okay. One of the first things you should make note of when you come into the space gallery is this vehicle over here, which held the, the monkeys, the primates as we call them, is a primate couch capsule. And it always reminds me of how we were so shook up about the Soviets having Sputnik up there. And of course, shortly after Sputnik was up there, they launched the dog Laika, which we called Mutnik, that shook us up a lot. And then we started flying monkeys and chimpanzees, and we thought we were really catching up to the Soviets. But then suddenly they launched Yuri Gagarin into orbit. We had missed the chance of getting our man into space before the Soviets did, but we had one more chimp flight to go. The result of it was, though, that we got thousands of telegrams from the supporters of the ASPCA, the Society for Prevention of Cruelty to Animals. So as a result of that, we launched Alan Shepard. Unfortunately, that story has been told before, but that's how we go about it. The seven of us, of course, were very close. Alan Shepard was our first man in space, and Gus Grissom, our second. John Herschel Glenn, Malcolm Scott Carpenter, Walter M. Wally Shaw, Leroy Gordon Cooper. We all knew each other's middle names, and I still call John Glenn Herschel, and Scott Carpenter I call Malcolm, Malcolm Scott. And Alan B. was, of course, Alan Shepard. And this, this is the, the fun of the relationship we had. The seven of us were bonded so closely, it's just unbelievable to compare it. Uh, we were sibling rivals, but as a result, we also became very dear close friends. We shared experiences with each other. Anything we did, we told the other about. I had some time in this Mercury spacecraft, which I called Sigma-7. I used the name Sigma, not for a fraternal name like Sigma Pi, as I was a Sigma Pi, but the fact that this was an engineering effort and Sigma meant sum of engineers. And it's been a, a reputation I'm very proud of that I became very close to the NASA engineers and the aerospace engineers and the technicians that made those spacecraft go. Well, of course, we went from Mercury to Gemini. I went from this silver suit, which is what you see Scott Carpenter wore. We're going to take that patch off there. That's a phony patch. Uh, we're very nervous about people using the wrong kinds of patches. Uh, my Gemini patch is correct, it was not on the suit, that's my Gemini suit there. We went from silver to white, got a little cleaner, but the uh, suits were, be were becoming more comfortable. They had to fit tighter and tighter in that we, when the suit's pressurized, you can't move if you have all this excess material in here, so you have to take it all out, make it fit, form fit. So those suits, I'm not sure if you could get in that suit right now, it'd be a very tight fit. I'm not sure anybody could get in that suit. Then we went on to the Apollo suit. And this is one that Bill Anders flew on Apollo 8. He went around the moon and he did take that picture that he claims he took. Uh, Borman and Lovell all claimed at one time they took that great picture of Earth from space, from the moon itself, with the moon in the background. Bill is very active here in San Diego and is an airplane collector. Uh, he has a P-51 he named after his wife, Valhalla. He goes to quite a few of the Heritage flight events and justifies having the airplane by appearing at many civic events, and he sure has earned his way to do that. The Apollo 8 crew, by the way, in my mind, was probably the most successful business crew. Frank Borman went on to become chairman of Eastern Airlines. Its demise was not because of Frank, it was because of civil regulations. Bill Anders became chairman of the Board of General Dynamics. Jim Lovell was a very successful communicator and business, and he is the owner, although his son runs it, of an absolutely fabulous restaurant in Chicago. So that crew did pretty well. <laughs> Oddly, they had a heck of a good mission going around the moon over Christmas. Probably the uh, thing that I'd like to point out next would be this Saturn 1B, which we used for Apollo 7. It was launched from that launch pad where we lost, excuse me, where we lost our Apollo 1 crew, and it's kind of a hard feeling to uh, look at something like that and realize what happened. 
This was the original model of the Saturn 1B with about 1.7 million pounds of thrust. Saturn V has seven and a half million pounds of thrust, so you, you get an idea of the immensity of the Saturn V. The little teeny man there makes the scale rather interesting to look at. The hard part of these missions was taking the elevator up and then walking across that cross arm to the command module into the white room. And we had a lot of fun with that. There's a arm much like that at the Kennedy Space Center Rocket Center outside. And that arm is actually on the ground. So we took the three of us in our suits hanging over the edge of that as if we were hanging over 300 feet above the ground. We had a picture taken of us looking very horrified at the thrill of the height. Another interesting part of the vehicle here, as you can see the arm coming out, there's a room that attaches to the Saturn 1B that's called the White Room. That is the room where the technicians prepare the spacecraft. And before the spacecraft is done, the last man there is a, or was our pad leader, Gunther Wendt, who was one of the von Braun people in Germany. And Don Isley had the only view of this room as we were getting ready to launch. He looked back and he said, I wonder where Gunther Wendt. I took that line, I stole it. But Gunther Wendt likes it, I like it. And that's how it goes. But that is the way I look at that model. I reminisce about it every time I see it. We do know where Gunther Wendt, we see him quite often. Take a, should we walk over to the southern model? Or the, Wherever you want. Yeah, okay. Hmm. Well, let's see what this is, yeah. Well, this board tells the story of the Gemini flights. And of course, I'm very proud of this picture of Gemini 7. <laughs> That's very weird. It says Gemini 6 is seen from Gemini 7. You've got to flip that around the next time you get the sign corrected. Gemini 7 didn't take those pictures. Gemini 6 took the pictures of the, of the dirty laundry hanging out of Gemini 7. What you see actually, those little wire things are part of the separation that came when the two vehicles came apart. It just looks like old laundry hanging out. So I know that, I, in fact, I took that picture. That's why I made note of that. So we'll get that corrected. It does list the Gemini flights and how, actually, Gemini 6, and it should be, have, it should be called Gemini 6 without the A. But other than that, it's a pretty good display. <laughs> the, uh, the fun of it is that Gemini 9, by the way, should not have an A either because they lost the Agena. They had a, a dummy vehicle sent up there. So I've got to nitpick this sign, I guess, don't I? Which is all right. That's what, we are. That's what it's all about. Let's walk over and take a look at this lunar module suit. This is unreal. This is not the suit that Armstrong wore. No one would dare put it on display like this. But can you imagine all the equipment they have? And yet even today, they have even more equipment for the so-called space station. The uh, space station has cameras on the side. The shuttle crews have cameras on the side. They, they finally caught on the fact that photography is the only way to keep track of what's going on, which is what we're doing right now. The, uh, the suit looks very cumbersome, and it weighed probably about 200 pounds. You take the uh, astronaut, maybe say 180 and 200 pounds or 380, it weigh one-sixth of that on the moon, so it's not too heavy. And they could actually, as you remember seeing videos of it, bouncing around the surface of the moon. Now it's amazing because you had to carry your, your supplies with you, the oxygen, the radio, the camera. And it was a rather interesting task that we had. We're finally discovering that the lunar dust is probably the, night, the nastiest part of the lunar mission. And it's sort of a crystalline glass kind of structure that can ruin seals like the, the pressure seal of the helmet pressure seals of the suit when you take it off and put it back on again in the lunar module. So as a result, we're probably going to, have to do some work on that before we go back to the moon again. We lucked out uh, with the missions we had so far, but it's going to be a very interesting task to uh, determine how to go to the moon and spend some time there, like months on the moon, where we have spent a little less than a day on the moon as it was. Not all together at once, but total time. Rather interesting time. now. Going up a little bit higher from the moon, you see what looked like Ed White coming out of the Gemini spacecraft. And that 
the, you see the difference in size of suits. Is, that was built only to accommodate the human body in not the weightless environment necessarily, but the fact there was no atmosphere, nothing to air, no air to breathe, so you had to pressurize it. And that's where this long hose that goes to the suit to pressurize the suit. That's a, an interesting display, not necessarily accurate, but it shows the, the sense of loneliness that you have if you're floating around in space. You're definitely not able to re-enter with that suit or any suit that we know of. So you have to get back on the spacecraft to uh, make everything work. All right, do you want to talk about this? What's that? <laughs> <coughs> back too far. Yeah. I may have to stand up for okay. you to talk about it. I had to tell that story about Alan Shepard, though. <laughs> <laughs> Got to get that on, on record. Okay, whenever you're ready. A fellow by the name of Ed Gard in Florida made these copies of the Mercury and, of course, then the Gemini and way over here the Apollo, the flying barn. But these copies are so well done it's unbelievable. Now you notice in the picture I was pointing at, it doesn't show the little jagged pieces hanging out because it's a model. The real spacecraft had particles hanging, the, the separation plate from this and the booster. The, uh, this reflector is just to retain the interior of the spacecraft, which is the, the support structure for the Gemini. And the actual Gemini spacecraft that the crew was in is in this blacker section up forward. I've had many of the curators come up to me and say, what are those bottles up there for? And it's rather interesting because those bottles retract. They're actually sensors. And they're what they call horizon sensors to determine the attitude of the spacecraft. Did you get a squeal? I'm getting radio interference again. Just out of the blue. Yeah. It wouldn't be this, would it? Well, the white structure supports the vehicle in orbit. Of course, it separates before re-entry. What's interesting, very few people take a good look and say, why can you have those two things sticking out that look like great resistance? And of course, they disappear and go inside on re-entry. But they are attitude horizon scanners, this is the proper term, that permit the spacecraft to fly under automatic control if the astronaut wants to relax and let the spacecraft fly under what we call, it's much like autopilot. The, uh, the devices, of course, retract inside before re-entry. We had those in Mercury as well. And we, when we use the automatic control system, we call that chimp mode, to go back to the old monkey chimpanzee mode. The engineers didn't like that term very much, but we used it quite frequently. I'm in chimp mode now. Well, it might be kind of fun to look at this little model over here. Now this, this massive stone you see in this piece of plastic was presented to me by NASA with the agreement that I in turn would present it to the Air and Space Museum here. Each of the Apollo astronauts have a lunar stone much like this. And of course, uh, it's very rare that an Apollo astronaut has an extra stone, but I did give one to Bill Len Lenartz, the director of the museum, which is in his possession, and only he can show that to you. You all know. <laughs> <laughs> I know that he believed you at first. <laughs> I told Francis about it. <laughs> I didn't want to put that on tape. That wouldn't be fair. <laughs> you know about this stone, too? <laughs> no. Well, haven't you ever seen this moonstone? We're ready to roll. Well, this area gives you sort of an overall view of the Apollo, Mercury, and Gemini spacecraft. Now, look at this monster over my head. It's quite clean, of course, contrasted to the actual Apollo 9 we saw earlier. This thing above me is the biggest truck that the band has put into space until the shuttle came along. And it was a very successful mission, the command service module structure that did go, in fact, to step a foot forward. 
put the foot in my mouth. That's better. Okay. Yeah, is, yeah. I think it's. I'm going to start over. <clears throat> <laughs> you have an alien going through here. <laughs> okay. Five, four, three. This is an exciting view of the three spacecraft that I recall very well, the Mercury, the Gemini, and of course above me the Apollo. It's amazing how clear the structure is, and we thought of it as a big truck in space, the Apollo command module and the service module. We don't even have the lunar module up there. You can imagine what a big system this was to put into space. Until the shuttle came along, it was probably the largest vehicle other than the Skylab. As a result, though, uh, we're beginning to think that maybe we better go back to Apollo again for the next mission to go to the moon, possibly, and I hope, fervently that we have the ability someday to get people interested enough that we might be able to go to Mars and back. It's an expensive mission, way beyond our capability right now. But it's kind of fun to come here through the space gallery. And remember, when you leave here, you've enjoyed the visit, but please go through the gift store. That's the only way you can leave a museum, is to go through the gift store and have some memories of where you were when you visited our space gallery. Wally Shira, thank you very much. Wonderful. Got it. Do you want to talk about that? Or that? No, that's all, that's all new stuff, yeah. Okay. Great. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Good. Okay. All set. This view from here always excites me. You see the command module, the service module behind it, the Gemini, behind it, the Mercury. As the space gallery matures and we get a newer one, you'll have a much better view of these vehicles. Of course, you saw the original Apollo 9 outside, which makes the one over my head look rather, rather fancy. Uh, this one hasn't been used very much. The, the fun of this is seeing the end of a space program going on into the future. The size of this command service module above me is even larger when you put the lunar module on it. So you can imagine what this will look like in the next future gallery. What I like about this though is as you leave the space gallery, you come to a gift shop where you can find some nice thing to remind you of this great visit to the space gallery at San Diego Air Space Museum. Thank you very much for your visit. Got very it. Nice.